Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. This Sunday, July 26th, is National Aunties Day, a day designated to celebrating the special bond between women and their nieces and nephews. It's an opportunity to highlight the unique and important contribution aunts make to the development of the children in their lives. So this Sunday, we honor these women. I'm an aunt, and so are many of you, and I've been wanting to cover this topic for some time now. So I'm so pleased to welcome the founder of Auntie's Day, Melanie Notkin, to the program. Here's a little more about Melanie. Melanie Notkin is the founder of Savvy Auntie, a celebration of modern aunthood, a multi-platform lifestyle brand for cool aunts, great aunts, godmothers, and all women who love kids. Melanie is the best-selling author of Savvy Auntie, the ultimate guide for cool aunts, great aunts, godmothers, and all women who love kids. Her book, Otherhood, Modern Women Finding a New Kind of Happiness, is a reported memoir, and it received a booklist starred review. Melanie is the foremost expert on the emerging demographic of childless, often single women. Her national data and insights have been featured in the New York Times, CNN, and more. Melanie is a contributor to the New York Post, WashingtonPost.com, Huffington Post, and PsychologyToday.com, among others. And she appears regularly on national television, radio, and podcasts. My interview with Melanie Notkin, the original savvy auntie and founder of Auntie's Day, up next. Next week is our 100th episode of Love and Life. As a thank you for your love and support, over the next several days, we'll be rolling out perks and freebies to our Love and Life family. Be sure you're on the VIP list to enjoy these insider perks by heading over to my website, loveandlifemedia.com, and clicking on the subscribe tab. Love and Life is for you, and I'm so excited to celebrate the 100th episode with my loyal and loving listeners. Melanie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Karen, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I've watched your work and been such a fan for many years. And really, when I started the podcast, you were someone I wanted to have on for a long time. So I'm fangirling over here a little bit. <laughs> I just love what you do, the support that you provide, what you call women of the otherhood. Your writing is beautiful. Your book feels like it's like it's a sociology text that's super vibrant and engaging and accessible, but it's also very academic in the sense that it's weighty because it's meaty, but again, accessible. So let's just start with explaining who is a woman of the otherhood. First of all, let me say to you that I am fangirling as well because you have built an extraordinary community of women of the otherhood and more. And your inspiration, the community that you engage is, is really inspiring to me. And I am so happy to be here to join the community and to talk to your community. So women of the otherhood are women who, they're probably uh, older millennials, Gen X, maybe some of the younger boomers, the daughters, uh, maybe you know, granddaughters of, of the feminist movement, Women who had expected to have the, the college education and the financial independence that our mothers didn't necessarily have the access to. And of course, you know, we'd have the husband and kids that they did. And yet among the most well educated, most financially independent and or successful in their careers or their passions, etc. Many of those women remain single and childless longer than they ever expected. 
And many are now, especially as the, the millennials are, are hitting 40, they're coming to the, the end of their fertility and wondering what happened. I did everything right. And yet the things that I wanted most are the things that are the ones that are, are most elusive. And the themes that you speak to in that statement right there and throughout your book and your work are just such intense themes. They are the things we want most. And yet, in this strange, odd way, we had the chance to have it all and then often didn't get it all. And we certainly question ourselves and That's exacerbated by the accusations from external forces and opinions saying things that it's our fault that we focused on our career too much. And of course, we think, well, we were supposed to, right? Our our mothers worked so hard so that we would have these opportunities. So we did what we were supposed to do. We focused on our career. And now you're saying that that's the reason I'm still single. And that's the reason that I'm not a mother. One of the things that I talk about with my community is that we still live in this era, despite all the advancements that women have been able to make, we still live in in a time when women are primarily valued valued for our relationships. We find our worth and we are deemed worthy by virtue of our relationships, who we're dating, who we're married to, who we are mother to. And you say that early in the book, you say, if not a mother wife, who are we? What will be our legacy? And what do we do now? And that's just so core to the frustration, the fear, the angst that so many women feel, and you speak to it so eloquently. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. We tend to too often see ourselves from the outside, the way that people see us, and we internalize that, and we decide that that's who we are. And that's not to say that we don't have our own desires and our own yearnings that are all very true. I I certainly, I'm not the type to say that society makes me this or society makes me feel that. I choose how I feel. The core point here is those to choose how you feel and and not to let others decide for you what it is, if anything, that you, quote unquote, did wrong. To your point about career, well, there are no career men. You know, we're called career women as if we chose one over the other, but we don't, you know, accuse men of that. We don't assume that a man, you know, can pay the rent and fall in love, get married and have children. Of course, women can do all of that. And of course, there are many married mothers. Most women in America, North America, in the West work. So it's not a matter of having to give up one for the other. And some will say, well, you know, you... Clearly, you're, you've been naive about your your fertility, or you know they'll say, well, you, you you probably just forgot that you don't have much time, and you know, and I want to remind everyone that says that that in fact we ourselves have a monthly reminder, mm-hmm. um, and not a pleasant one. <laughs> you know, the women who uh, you know who tend to be in their mid thirties and later who want children and remain childless, those women tend to have graduated college, sometimes a master's degree or more. This cohort of women know math, and they understand (laughs) how it works. Now, they may be hopeful, and they may be very optimistic, but they they do know that, that fertility does come to an end. And what they are doing, of course, is waiting for love. And while some may say, well, that's That's passive. What do you mean just waiting for love? Well, they don't mean it in a passive way. They're dating. They're out there. They're doing everything they can to find that connection. No woman has ever said to a man who proposes the love of her life, no, no, sorry, I I have a conference call in like five. (laughs) Women are doing their very best to make the relationship that they want the most be their primary focus. However, to your point, I interviewed um, several women, as you know, and one was about 35, and we were talking about how she you know, wants to be married and wants to have children, etc. She was in 
finance. And she says, well, you know, I'm, I've been married to my career. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean you've been married to your career? You know, I'm, I'm a career woman. And I said, well, did anybody ever ask you out? And you said, no, 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 no. It was always a priority. I mean, of course. Well, then why do you call yourself a career woman? And she said, isn't that what I'm supposed to say? Mm. So we were given these scripts. And that's what I meant earlier about, you know, how society talks to us. If we internalize that, if we believe it, that's mm. where the problem starts. And I love that because that is true empowerment, because we don't have to internalize every message that we receive. We absolutely don't. And I know from the women I interact with, they try hard and they do, they get worn out though sometimes. Because, <laughs> and also, as you speak to in the book, they question themselves and they, they do, they have moments where they go, am I being too picky? Am I too focused on my career? Because they're trying to explain the inexplicable. Yeah. And I know that oftentimes their friends and family point the finger at them and blame the victim, so to speak, they're also trying to explain the inexplicable. And our minds, cognitive psych shows us our minds want to make sense. We are always mm -hmm. actively trying to make sense of our environment and of our experiences. So the inexplicable just drives everyone crazy. I mean, oh my gosh, there's so many instances in your book where people just say the things you can't believe they would say to you. And I experienced that myself for so many years, and I speak to that in my book as well. But also, oftentimes I do know they're not trying to be hurtful. They're baffled, <laughs> and it's understandable. And when I was doing research for my book, I found a study by Christine Whalen, who's a sociologist, and she looked at women in the age bracket of 30 to 44, that for women who earned over $100,000 a year, so they'd be in those more high-powered positions and probably have been accused of focusing too much on their career, well, they were even more likely to be married than women earning less. So this notion of these career women not focusing enough on marriage, it's just false. So it's really a myth that's out there, but it gets perpetuated again because I think people just don't have answers. Exactly. And and not only that people are frustrated because they don't know what it is, whether it's their daughter or their sister or their best friend or whomever, and the women themselves are questioning, maybe I don't know how to love. Maybe I, it's just not in me. Maybe I, I, I can't fall in love or maybe I'm not lovable or maybe, you know, I, I should move. Maybe I, I shouldn't have gone for my graduate degree. Maybe, you know, all of those maybes, right? But there's also the idea that those who were fortunate enough to get the, the love and marriage or partnership and, and motherhood that they yearn for early, they decide it couldn't have happened to them. Mm -hmm. I would have made better decisions. Mm -hmm. I would have known better. You said the blame the victim. When we hear about somebody who gets into trouble or is victimized or hurt, well, I wouldn't have been out late at night. Right. I wouldn't have been in that area. You want yourself to feel safe. Those people who do it, especially women, put themselves in that place at, let's say, age 35 or 40 or what have you, and they say, oh, no, 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 I would have done it differently. I would have got on more date. Whatever she's doing, I would have done it better, which is all about them. And it's infuriating to the woman of otherhood who's trying so hard to do everything she can. And your point about we were told we could have it all, well, that was always a fallacy. It was a great slogan. You know, there was a <laughs> Helen Gurley Brown, you know, wrote the title of her book in the in the mid mid eighties. However, she said she never liked that title. In fact, her book Sex and the Single Girl doesn't talk about motherhood having children. I, I think there might be one mention of it literally in, in that whole seminal book of the of the sixties. So this idea of having it all was not something that was ever really proposed to us as something that we were supposed to do, but rather we had the potential to have so much more than our mothers had the potential to have. And it doesn't mean that we were choosing one part of all of this, whether it's education, career, love, marriage, motherhood, and everything in between, but rather 
because we went to college, so we were getting married and then having a child later than before. And of course, now in, in 2020, women are having are more likely actually to have their first child in their 30s than in their 20s or younger. But the, the question is about delay. I think it was 2012, the U.S. Census came out with a fertility report, and it called, they dubbed it the delayer boom, <laughs> how women, you know, 35 plus with a college degree were, quote unquote, delaying a parent to motherhood. And yet I spoke soon after to the author of a, of a study from the CDC about this, and Looking at the women who remain childless at age 35 plus, 81% hope, expect, you know, want, yearn for children. So these women aren't delaying. They're single. And somehow we keep forgetting that really important piece because people say, well, you could just have a baby on your own. But yet women want family. And that doesn't mean you want to be a mother less because you want to be a mother with someone you love. Right. If you're looking for some in-depth support, head over to my website, loveandlifemedia.com and click on the work with me tab to schedule a consultation. Consultations will help you clarify underlying emotional and psychological concerns. We'll target limiting beliefs and thought patterns. We'll learn empowering techniques from cognitive therapy to sustainably elevate your mindset and mood We'll identify relationship dynamics which are impeding your goals and we'll together generate a concrete plan for moving forward to help you thrive in love and life. Schedule your consultation today at loveandlifemedia.com. I'd love to work with you. You speak to this also in the book that women will be asked very invasive questions about, Mm -hmm. well, don't you want children? And I mean, I was, (laughs) I was getting my teeth cleaned and I had just gotten married. I got married at 42. So definitely I delayed all these things, Melanie. (laughs) Yes. Delay, delay. (laughs) It was, yeah, it was in my big master plan. I want to delay everything. (laughs) And uh, the hygienist asked me if I had kids. And of course, you know, that's awkward anyway, because you can't talk <laughs> when they're cleaning your teeth. But I said, no. And she said, well, didn't you want kids? And uh-huh. I thought, I literally met you like 30 seconds ago. And this is not a personal conversation I care to have with someone who's providing me a very important service, but it's not, it's not something I want to discuss right now. It's very, that's a very complex question. And I, I so resonate with your approach because that's my heart too. And I think when I look at my community and what I, mean, I was thinking about what separates women of the otherhood from other women, we just didn't want to settle for mediocre. And you use that exact word and I use that exact word a lot when I'm encouraging folks not to settle because wouldn't you rather have an extraordinary life living authentically than to phone it in just so the life looked good on paper and I called off a wedding at 34, two months before the wedding, I was a runaway bride. And it was that reality that I was living the life I was supposed to live because I desperately wanted to be a mother and I desperately wanted to have a family, as you said, but I chose love over children. And then that makes you look to the outside observer, well, then she must not like kids or she must have done something wrong. Like you said earlier, the idea of, well, I would have done it differently. I would have figured out a way. And you speak to that too with the women who are newly divorced and on the dating scene now in their late 30s, early 40s. They don't get it because their first marriage came relatively on time in quotes And then they're back in the scene and assuming that all these ever single women are doing something so wrong. And once they hop back on the scene, they'll snatch up a guy in no time. And I think many women then find that, oh, wow, it's not as simple as I had imagined it would be. Yes, we do get asked the questions and they're not like the way you put it, you know, well, didn't you want children? They're they're not asked gently. They're they're more accusatory. And yes, I've been asked that myself. And I've said, well, I'm, 
I wanted to have a child with the man I love and I'm single. And there's still sort of this accusation, well, then you you must be picky. My comeback for this, and, and frankly, I prefer to be a very, you know, very positive person and, and give everyone benefit of the doubt. And I very rarely say anything rude or nasty to anybody because that's just not my style. But once I did say, because I, I knew this woman and she has a fantastic husband, and I said, oh, so so you weren't picky when you married Jeff? Right. Because I think he's great. I don't think that's settling. So I hope you would expect the same for me. And love comes when love comes. You know, I say that love isn't a gift for those who deserve it. It's a reward for those who wait for it. And some of us, wait longer. I'm 51. And well, I've had love in my life and I've certainly had broken hearts. I didn't, I couldn't settle for someone I didn't love. And and if anything, because he deserves love. I had to look at it that way. When I first called off my wedding, I felt like a train wreck and like a disaster. And we dated four years, including a year of being engaged. And I'm a psychologist, so I probably should have been a little more self-aware. But that piece that you just spoke to, that he deserved better. He did not deserve. I mean, who? what, what groom wants to know, here's my bride walking down the aisle to me, and she's settling. I'm good enough. I mean, that's just, that's cruel. So the flip side of women of the otherhood is that they're kind and they're not going to use someone essentially for his sperm. There's this other angle that doesn't ever get spoken to. It's it's never underscored, which is why I love what you do because you're speaking to it and you're underscoring it. And I remember in the book there was a part where you said something, you had you're like, I'm not picky. I have three things. I want to be smart, Jewish, and I want to have sex with him. And the person you're speaking to was like, don't be funny right now. You were getting ready for a blind date or something. And mm-hmm. And I, I kept reading that over, like, wait, wh- what was funny about that? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I, I want to have great sex with whomever I'm married to. I want to have any kind of sex with him. I want, I want to want to have <laughs> sex with him. And the idea that this is like, oh, well, you know, now you're asking too much. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't think so at all. I think that, that is a very important part of marriage. And being single for as long as I've been single, I know what the other side of that looks like, aka not a lot of sex. And it's not great. And we're not going to risk our health or anybody else's health to have quote unquote one night stands because that's what so many people, you know, imagine we're, we're doing when we're single. Mm -hmm. Um, We're having all, you know, I I remember saying when sex in the city was on, I'd say, well, no, I was having brunch with my girlfriends talking about all the sex we weren't having the night before. Yeah. And I'm sure people, those who see, oh, there's Melanie just living her Carrie Bradshaw life. I'm sure that's the other, the glorification of your tripping the light, fantastic single girl about town. And I'm sure, and that also feels, and again, I don't, people aren't trying to be hurtful, but that also is not the picture. As you said, it's not the reality of what single life is. It's a lot of lonely, lonely moments. And it's a lot of resilience from those many broken hearts. And it's a lot of self-empowerment because, you know, you can't lean on anyone to do the things, whether it's helping with groceries up a, a, a three flat or you have to lick your own wounds and, and put band-aids on your own bumps and bruises. And so there's it's just such a complex reality. And one that, again, if you're not a woman of the otherhood, you don't fully get it, which is why it's so wonderful, this community you've created so that people can feel validated and understood. Thank you. Yes, th- this idea that we're supposed to be sad and depressed, not be everything else that we are, because we still yearn for other things. Well, of course, that doesn't make sense. You know, we should be uh, everything that we are, is certainly in this present moment. Because I am not a professional like you, I always hesitate to give advice to women who come to me for help other than these few things. Number one, 
when they say, I'm 38 years old, do I stay with the man I love who does not want more children because he's divorced with kids? Or do I leave him and hope, you know, for love and children? My answer is, well, you, you know the answer. Because I truly believe that a woman does and she just needs permission. I don't know what the answer is, but I want her to, to know she can, she's the agency to make a decision. And often enough, they do choose love. And sometimes they choose to, to leave and, and see if they can find love again and motherhood or motherhood as a single woman, etc. The second word of advice I give women who say to me, well, you know, I, I'm so sad because now, you know, all of my friends are married or my, uh, my best friend just had her second child and I just broke up with my boyfriend. And my advice to them is, you know, if you, if you measure your happiness against others, you'll never be happy. Hmm. You have to find your own happiness, your own understanding of what that is. And if you measure that, against somebody else's ruler, you'll never find it within yourself. Too often we think about a life that doesn't exist, whether that life is the life we imagined when we were 10 years old, about the wedding we'd have and the, what the bridesmaids would wear, or like I did, you know, I literally bought a baby name book when I was 12 because I was mm -hmm. so sure I was going to have twin girls. And by the way, my wish did come true because my brother has actually two sets of twin girls. So I was, oh. I, and they came out of, no, we don't have twins in the family, but so I, my vision was right. Just a little off course. Right. So when we think about that vision and today at whatever age we are in our, you know, thirties, forties, and that vision has not come to pass, we're, we, we mourn that dream that that child had. Or even if it wasn't as a child, even if it was, you know, you were dating somebody for a number of years and, and maybe he called off the wedding and everything you expected, just the rug got swept up from under you. The idea that of mourning the future, a future that we don't even know, I understand because I've done it too, can be devastating. But what I, I want women to do, and maybe this is my third word of advice, is to live in today and don't set expectations for today based on the dreams of when you were a child or even the dreams of, of yesterday. For instance, when you're on a date and you know that this guy from the moment you sit down is, is not the guy you're going to fall in love with for whatever reason, be in the moment. Yeah. Enjoy the date. Be there. When we're in our 20s, and we think, oh, well, we've had another bad date. Oh, he's such a nerd or whatever it is. We're already, we're not even there anymore. We're no longer present. We're thinking about, should I go back on Tinder tonight? What would that other guy, he called me. I should go out with him. We're always on to the next. In our 30s, we are a little bit more anxious now as, as our fertility is, is becoming more, more urgent to address. And we may miss him because... If he's not the one, then we want to discount him really quickly and move on to the next. And we become often, unfortunately, pessimistic or negative. And, and it kind of shows and or the opposite. We become almost too aggressive. And it's almost like we're trying too hard. We're never really who we are. I found that when I was in, got to my 40s, and I would go on a date or frankly, anything, I would be much more there in the moment. And while if, even if I knew that the man wasn't the man I would end up with, there was always something interesting about him. There was always something I could learn about him or about myself or about the world. I could remember what the, mu the music that was playing in the background. I could look at the decor and appreciate it. I was there in the moment. Again, if we keep measuring our lives based on our best friend who just had her second kid, you know, the way we were when we were a child, how we envisioned our life and how we expected our life to be at age 40 based on quote unquote society or what other people expect of us, we'll never be here in our in ourselves in this moment. And there is nothing more important than that. People will ask me, well, Melanie, come on, don't you have any regrets? You must have a grace. There must be some great guy who you, you broke off with. And well, 
I truly don't believe there was. But even so, no, I I don't have regret because I believe that regret is behind me. Mm -hmm. And if I'm back there, I'll never be right here to see him standing right in front of me. You mentioned that you're not a professional and you don't like to give kind of therapeutic advice, but everything you just said was very therapeutic, (laughs) very much so. Starting with the the response of whoever is giving you a question that they know the answer, if they look within and really therapy is much more about holding up a mirror so a client can see himself or herself with more clarity than about advice giving. But also the the portion about being in the now is very much, there's a, an entire movement I'm sure you're aware in psychotherapy and in just the psych literature in general of mindfulness and the power of the here and now. And it really is the only thing we have. It is. We don't have the past. And so much of mental health concerns, when people ruminate about the past, that's related to depression. And when people are freaked out about a future that hasn't arrived yet, well, that's obviously related to anxiety. So you're actually quite therapeutic in your responses. <laughs> well, <laughs> it you. Yeah. What you just said also reminds me of one of my favorite quotes that I stumbled upon in, gosh, it must have been my late 20s or early 30s maybe right after I called off my wedding because of just the timing of how it struck me. And it's by Joseph Campbell. And it says, we must be willing to let go of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. Mm, Yes. And I so resonated with that. It was just some little quote that was, I think it was like L magazine fashion spread, but there was this little quote (laughs) and I tore it out and I taped it into my closets because I wanted to, when I was, in the morning, grabbing my clothes, I want to be reminded of that and to embrace the life that I actually had instead of the life that I had envisioned and to find the beauty therein and to not see it as less than despite any other metric that other people may have been looking at me and assessing my life. Because as you spoke to earlier, it's not about that. It just isn't unless I, that doesn't matter unless I decide it matters. And if I decide that other people's opinions about my path and my journey and my choices if I decide it matters, then it will. And like many in my community and the women of the otherhood, there is a struggle there at times because we are doers. We are ambitious. We go after it. And we did that with our education, check. And we did that with our career, check. And then we try to do that with love. And love doesn't play by those same (laughs) rules of try really hard and get the prize and try really hard and get the reward. It doesn't work like that, which can be frustrating for women who are trying to take charge and take ownership. There's that that tension there. Yes, absolutely. And I and I write about that in in Otherhood. The very thing they cannot control is often the thing they want the most. And some do make concessions. Well, you know, I instead of being on the the partner track, uh, I'll move into you know HR or marketing at the law firm. You know, trying to to lessen their hours, or some will date people who may not be exactly who they you know were had expected to date. If you're a white collar woman, you should you know date more blue collar men. And I know you 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 spoke to John Berger, and he probably brought this up from the <laughs> author of, of Datanomics. You know, and I and I write about that in a, in a chapter of my book called "Is He Got Robbed," where you know a woman did that exact thing, and he was having an affair with a school teacher and left her for the school. He was a police officer. So yes, you know, we we really, the thing we can't control is often the thing we want most. The title of the book was always Otherhood, and it was a play on motherhood, but it became existential in terms of, you know, being other to mother, being a second sex to women of our own sex, Mm. because often enough women without children are looked at as incomplete or, you know, to your point about the Carrie Bradshaws, et cetera. And, you know, again, women be- begin to believe that we are other to mother, that we are not fulfilled like a mother is, et cetera. And, you know, what I say is if we believe that, if we believe that we are other to mother or to any other person who we have developed into those those years that have passed, then we are. Yep. If you believe you are second best or other two, then you are. And 
you know, the best way to empower oneself, and I'm not saying it's it's easy, but the best way to empower oneself with this life that we are living is to is to know that this is not the other, but this is Melanie Notkin. This is who I am. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to play second fiddle to a life that doesn't exist. Mm. I'm, I'm the maestro. That's, that's exactly it. It's, and there's really, like you said, it's not easy, but it's simple. It's really not any more complex than that. I had a, a woman in my community reach out to me. I was doing some sessions during COVID to try to support my community, especially as you mentioned, so many of the women that I interact with are single or living by themselves. And that that feels isolating enough some days. And now with COVID, of course, it could be excruciating. And I was speaking with her, she was about to turn 30. And she was like, some of the women you described, all are married and some were pregnant. And she was inconsolable. And I tried to share some thoughts and just to validate her pain and her her sadness. And when I tried to suggest some of the things that you're talking about here, she wasn't having it. And it was heartbreaking for me to see. Of course, now from my perspective, she still was quite young and still had lots of time for that life to even perhaps go in the, in the direction that she would like, that she's planned out. But she really couldn't see value in anything. And she didn't see that it was, in fact, her decision to choose the vantage point that her life was less than, that it was meaningless, that everything else going on, her career, her hobbies, her travels, her anything else was just not worth it, was inconsequential because the thing Mm -hmm. she wanted most wasn't happening on the time schedule that she was very rigid in her insistence that it had to happen in that time schedule. And I understand that, but I also, I love how you highlight that really it's the power is ours to decide what our value is. And in doing so, those feelings of despair and pain, they actually lessen. It's really that mental shift that then in in cognitive psych, we talk about you change our thoughts, which changes the emotions because those emotions are fueled by some sort of thought. And when we change that belief that we're adhering to, that's really where the power is. Exactly. I agree. And, and again, you know, she's, living in, in her imagination mm-hmm. of what was supposed to happen and being there in that fog, <laughs> in the fog of war, as they say, she can't see clearly of what mm-hmm. is in front of her. She can't move forward. And it's, I could, I feel, I, I empathize with her. We've all been there. The, the problem is if we're there for too long, if it becomes a chronic state of mind, because it begins to show on the outside, not just the inside. And, and we, we, be, we fulfill our own, our own prophecy, especially at that age, where to your point, there there still is thankfully plenty of time for those dreams to, and I use dreams, you know, in a literal fashion here, for those dreams to to come true. When women ask me, how is it that I'm okay? That I'm okay that at 51, that I hadn't become, didn't become the mother I, I yearn to become, and because I do write about it. And in fact, wrote Otherhood, the book about it, that that felt cathartic. Well, actually, I don't know that that's the right word. It it felt like I was through my, you know, literally writing it down because I would write a lot by hand. Mm. It would come out of me. And I found that w- when women are in that, that point of grief, where otherwise everything else in their in their world is going great and because they'll email me and I don't know them, but I can see from, you know, the, their email that they're, you know, senior vice president of what have you, that mm-hmm. their career is going well, et cetera. I, I say, you know, every day, first thing in the morning, write one page of how you're feeling and don't judge yourself. You don't even have to reread it. Just write it down. And the next day, do the same and do it for 30 days. And after 30 days, if you're still in pain, email me again. But just write it down. And I don't really hear from them again. And I don't know if that's because they've taken my advice or they didn't take my advice and didn't think it was smart. But I know for me that when you write it down and you see it, 
you know, when you're writing it down, you're, you're almost like two voices, right? You're the one that's hearing the mm-hmm. thought, I'm nothing, my life is not. And the one who's, you know, taking mm-hmm. down the dictation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the one taking down the dictation is saying, oh, come on, it's not that bad. Yeah. And that's also therapeutic to write it down. And like you said, the process of putting these nebulous thoughts that might be bouncing around our inside our minds and putting them down, we concretize them. We then can write it and then read it. It's more objective to be able to read that thought. And then we process it again and go, huh, do I really think that? So that's also very therapeutic. I'm telling you, Melanie, you've got some skills. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Let's connect on social. I'm most active on Instagram, where I post original quotes, infographics, and I tackle trending topics in my Love Smarter, Not Harder IGTVs. On Insta, you can find me at Dr. Karen, D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. I'm also on Facebook at Dr. Karen Anderson April and on Twitter at Dr. Karen Anderson. And that's a question I get a lot as well. And definitely with my, you call them uh, the dating Bermuda Triangle when you're in that window there. Explain that a little bit and then I'll follow up with the question. The dating Bermuda Triangle are women who are about 35 to 40, 42. It's the time when all of a sudden, you know, as as women become more and more concerned about whether or not they will have a child with, with someone they love, the men are becoming more and more concerned that this woman or these women only really want them for their for their money and their sperm. <laughs> and once they have that, they're going to leave them. Mm. And so men will say, I don't date women that age because you know they they they're just gonna use me. And well, I'm not denying, I'm sure that has happened in, in, in to some man at some point. That is really not what these women want. In fact, and, and I've said this to the men who have said this to me, I, I'd say, you know, these women are capable in everything else in their life. They want love. If they, if they were just going to marry anybody, take his money and his sperm, they would have married somebody richer and younger <laughs> than you when they were younger. Right. So no, that's not what they want. You should feel extra special because if they fall in love with you, know that they were waiting a long time to meet you. Mm. So it really should mean the opposite. But yes, too many women feel like, wait, wait a minute, here I am. I'm, I'm in my prime. Everything's going well at work. I just bought my own apartment. I'm yeah, now I'm vice president. Of, like I work out all the time. Where are the guys? Mm-hmm. So there's this dynamic though, and it, and it changes where it, at this point, women at this age are, are really leaning in. Sorry, what's her name? Sandberg. I don't mean to take your trademark, <laughs> but they're leaning in to the date, right? And because they're really trying so hard and they will go wherever the guy said, you know, well, I'm all the way downtown and I know it's pouring rain, but I'm working late. So it'd really be helpful if you came down here and she does because maybe this is him and I'm 38 and oh my God, mm-hmm. where I really want to encourage women to actually do their best to lean back and to be present, be in the moment. But the more, and this sounds all cliche, et cetera, but when he trusts that you trust that he is the quote unquote uh, traditional man, right? When he knows that, wow, she doesn't just want me for my money and my sperm. She wants me to take care of things, to make the reservation, to, to take care of her, to make sure she feels good, to, to spend the money that I have, if he has money, right, on her. When we do that, I have noticed that they feel more confident that she really is there for the relationship and not there because she's too eager to have a baby. The good news about the the Bermuda Triangle is that once you are found, the the rescue planes come to save you. (laughs) You you know, all of a sudden, you know, because you're you're more self-confident for all the things that brings women in their 40s. What happens actually is very interesting. The men are the ones who really start to lean in. 
the men are the ones who all of a sudden at age 50 find themselves single or single again, more often single again, and they don't really know how to live single and they want to find a relationship really quickly. And meanwhile, we women who of the other hood or, you know, in their 40s or even 50s, we're good. Yeah, no, we're good. I'm confident. Oh, you have to break the day. All right. We have this other, you know, a different personality. And the men are the ones who are leaning in. And and that creates its own dynamic, which doesn't necessarily work for women. So we are unfortunately, as, as much as I know that a younger generation would like to see the quote unquote gender norms blur or disappear. I, and I can't speak for, for those dating at age 23. I, I know that most Gen X plus or even older millennials are still, you know, I, I say we may be modern women, but we do like old fashioned romance. And I think that one way for women of otherhood to connect with men is to is to let them lead sometimes. And while, again, we are the women who are supposed to have it all and do it all and be in control of everything, sometimes it can be really powerful to know we can do it and let him do it anyway. I have found for me that has been the thing that makes men I'll use the term, uh, an internet term, internet marketing term being sticky. <laughs> like they're the ones who are like, oh, wait. So that's what seems to have been working for me and for, for a number of women who just say, you know, all I want him to do is plan the first date. If he plans the first date, I know everything will go well from there because I know that he's making an effort to make me feel special. Yeah. And even in the beginning of the book, you bring up that there's this sense that so many of the men that, and the women that you were speaking with, the men that they were dating, put all the planning in their laps. Well, the, oh, you know, you, you live in that neighborhood, so you take the lead on that. And that was a turnoff. And again, it's this tension with the theme we spoke to earlier of, yes, feminism has changed so many things in a wonderful way, in an empowering way. But sometimes that old fashioned romance, as you spoke to, the lines are getting blurred and people don't, aren't sure of their roles. And that can feel frustrating for a woman who wants that dynamic in her partnership and in her marriage. The, the best way to make that happen, if that's what she wants, is to tell the guy. <laughs> I, you know, the men they I can't read yeah. our minds and we get frustrated when they don't. So I know, and it's equally frustrating for the guys if we don't know what they want, because a lot of men think, well, no, but don't you want to pay for the date? Mm -hmm. Don't you want it? Right. No, no. You know, so we have to say what we want, ask for what we need. And, and often enough, men react really well to that. Because imagine, you know, these are the guys who were also the sons of feminism, mm -hmm. and their mothers were the ones who, you know, if they weren't stay at home moms, they, and they were working, most of them were not, um, their income wasn't very high. There, there were the, the homes were often more quote unquote traditional as that time between, you know, the 1950s and the 1990s. And guys are like, well, you want to control everything. Where do I fit in? And sometimes we can leave a little room or a lot of room for the guy to know that he feels like he's contributing. And I know that women, we, we so really, really want to take care of everything and be in control of everything because that's what we were told we could and should mm -hmm. do. But scientists have found, and, and actually uh, I, in, in Esther Perel's uh, Mating in Captivity, mm -hmm. she talks about how the, the most high-powered woman, the most high-powered woman who's doing everything, whether or not she has kids, she is doing so much nurturing, whether it's a co-worker, whether it's a child or a niece or nephew or her partner or the neighbor or her, and her parents. She's doing so much of that, that when it comes time for intimacy, she just wants to lay back. <laughs> and Esther Perel will say, you know, be submissive. So we, we have to understand that, that we, we may be one way by day and another way by night or vice versa, that there are many dynamics to us and that the best way to foster relationships that we're interested in fostering is to be honest and sincere about what we need and what we want. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's right for the partner, mm -hmm. but at least we're, we're being honest. And I, I find too much that women won't 
be honest when a woman will say, well, when, you know, someone says something terrible to you about, well, you know, you, you probably didn't want to be a mother because women who really want to be a mother find a way to do it. You know, I, I just want to tell them to, nah, 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 and I'm like, no, 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 because that's not the truth. Why don't you tell them the truth? The truth is I very much want to be a mother. I have grieved. Sometimes I don't know how I'm going to get out of bed because I, I always expected I'd be a mother. And I'm not. We don't obviously want the other person to be terribly uncomfortable. Depends who you're talking to. But um, being honest is the only way that we're going to help those conversations transition into ones that are more productive. And so we need to flip the, the script on this. We need to help everybody, whether it's somebody we're dating, whether it's, you know, a parent, a, a sibling or friends or coworkers or, or some stranger at the dentist office <laughs> who says something to us. If we aren't honest about our experience, then how can we expect them to understand it? That's so beautifully stated. And it's so true. It takes a level of vulnerability that I think sometimes People don't want to share that honesty because it is so painful. And probably if they've shared in the past, they maybe it wasn't well received or maybe someone tried to fix it, you know, oh, with another 400 suggestions about what they should do and they, what they could do differently and do better and change. But if we could get to that place where we could be more honest and then help others understand, I'm just being honest and I'm not asking you to fix this or to console me. I'm just letting you know the reality. That would be a really very beautiful place for us to get to. And I think your work moves us in that direction. So again, thank you for your writing and for all you do. As we wrap up, Melanie, I want to ask you the question that I get so often, and you mentioned it a bit, but maybe just speak a little bit more as we wind down to how are you okay? Because I get that a lot too. You you aren't a biological mother. I'm not a biological mother. And I'm, I want to address this more in my podcast because it's definitely a pain point. And it seems to be for many of my listeners, something that they don't really, they really don't think that they have this, the skills and the tools to manage. Like you talked about, they're fearful that if they reach that time when their fertility is over and they aren't a mother, that they won't be able to get out of bed and that they will struggle to view their life as having the value and the meaning and the purpose that they want it to have. But without biological children, they're very fearful that it won't feel that they have that meaning and purpose. And of course, one of the ways that you've done this is your brand Savvy Auntie. So maybe speak to that and then also any recommendations for how you have resolved that. Sure. Well, first of all, biologically, as a, as a woman enters her later perimenopause and menopause, she no longer has the yearning to have children, or at least to that degree. And so she can, she can remember her grief, she can respect and honor her grief, and all the things that she felt, and, and she may have pangs now and again. But Thank God, um, we were actually designed to let it go. Mm. So there, there is relief coming for those. Another, as I said earlier, is to to be in the now and to to grieve something in your imagination, something that doesn't exist. Is there's there's no end in sight to that because it it, it is what we really want often enough with disenfranchised grief is for it to be acknowledged and appreciated as real whole grief. And yet we also have to, at the same time, appreciate within ourselves that we are grieving a fantasy you know, so, or something in our imagination that, that doesn't exist. And the more time we spend in that, we keep going down this rabbit hole. And so it's not easy, but often enough, we, we imagine, well, my life won't be what I want it to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, etc. Yes, but your life probably won't be that way anyway, whatever you do. And then I've said that babies are, are born from the womb. Maternity is born from the soul. And there are many ways to mother. And I don't mean that aunthood in whatever form, whether it's biological, uh, 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 and by relation to a, a sibling's 
child or an ad by choice to a friend's child or in any other way that one, whether one's a teacher, a pediatrician, et cetera, that one embraces the children in their life. I don't mean that that replaces one's yearning for motherhood, but one realizes her value as an aunt. And there is quite a lot of value in that. First of all, we give a child a a different worldview, whereas, you know, for instance, you could be an artist and, you know, your nephew is really inspired by what you do and comes to you with all those questions, et cetera, and he becomes an artist. I mean, that's, you know, sort of obviously a a benign example, but there are many ways for an aunt to have a an influence, a positive influence on, on a child's life. Also, when we are with uh, certainly our little nieces and nephews from zero to three, essentially, when we play with them, which is essentially what an aunt does, we go to visit them, we want to play with them. That is actually helping develop them, their emotional skills, their social skills, their cognitive skills, even their motor dexterity. When we give them a bath and, and a, you know, we have a cup of water and, we've, and they fill it with water in the bath and it sinks to the bottom and then we take the water out and it flows on top. Well, that's physics. So we're actually teaching children, right? And if we see the value of what I call qual ante time, the quality time we spend with our nieces and nephews, we will see, in fact, some of them, as I, I use the term confidant, the confidant, that when they come to us, they, where they may not want to go to their parent first, whatever is going on in their life, they will be tested out. I, you know, as I say, I'm not their mom, I'm not their friend, I'm their aunt, the perfect blend, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they can come. In fact, many adolescents will go to their aunt first to come out to them, sort of as a testing ground. So there are many ways to, to be other types of mothers to a child. And, and for many, in fact, a woman who did, she was married, suffering from fertility. She, she did end up having a son. But before that happened, she said to me that, you know, following me on Twitter and Facebook is a few years ago that she was able to acknowledge and value the role she played in her nieces and life, nieces and nephews in her life. And that didn't fill her up completely. It certainly filled her up more so than, than not realizing the role that she plays. So sure you know, in 2009, I established the, the first annual Aunties Days. It's the fourth Sunday in July, and this year it's Sunday, July 26th. It is a day like Mother's Day in May and Father's Day in June for children and friends and family and oneself to acknowledge this important role that, that ants play in a child's life. Because of course, you know, everything an ant does is is generous. There's no legal obligation like there is with parented to ant a child. Mm-hmm. And so feel appreciated and acknowledged for all that ants do. Anybody who loves a child, not her own, the valuable role that we play in, in the family village can and should be acknowledged. And if a woman feels that her family or friends, et cetera, don't acknowledge it, although many families do, we've done studies that meant most families do acknowledge the the roles that they play, she should at the very least acknowledge her important role, her vital role in those children's lives. And I'll keep on my end with my platforms putting a spotlight on the valuable role of, of these women, the what I call the pank or professional at no kids, 23 million women, 18 plus who love a child, not her own. So Angie's Day again is Sunday, July 26th and every fourth Sunday in July. And for more, I'm Savvy Auntie, S-A-V-V-Y-A-U-N-T-I-E on all the, the socials. And I hope that those in the otherhood and in your community will, will come join the, the entourage, A-U-N-T, and hopefully find a reason to celebrate who they are today and certainly on Sunday, July 26th. Thank you for that. It's such a great platform. It's so powerful. And to, as you put it, shine a spotlight on this important role that we play. And I love that you underscore that the, an auntie's love is extra special in a way because it doesn't have to be there. There's no obligation. So it's coming from this place of just sincere desire to connect and to nurture and to be a part of the development of a young person. And in that sense, we do have a legacy, even though it may not be the legacy we anticipated, we shouldn't minimize the legacy that we do bring to our nieces and nephews. Thank you again, Melanie, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure and my honor. Thank you so much for having me on. The love and life hack for this week is 
aunties matter. We women of the otherhood, despite the fact our lives haven't played out as planned, we can be assured our nurturing and influence make a big difference and have a positive impact on the children we choose to love. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. As always, thank you so very much for joining us this week. Happy Auntie's Day. And don't forget to subscribe to my email list to take advantage of the thank you perks we're rolling out to celebrate Love and Life's 100th episode next week. I wouldn't be doing 100 episodes if you weren't listening. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And until next time, make it a great week. Love and Life is produced by Tim May and hosts and executive producer, Dr. Karen Anderson-Abram.